first of all, to everyone. I uh, wanted to let you know this is going to be recorded. So if you, when the little box comes up on your screen, if you can hit continue, uh, just get can be recorded. Um, this is being sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Beach Cities, and we're very glad to have you here. Um, we have a health and wellness uh, committee that Melinda McBride and Harriet Chase uh, co-chair, and they are the ones that have brought Dr. Benton on for the talk today. Um, before we get to that, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you can mute yourself and maybe turn off your video, that will improve our chances of having a really slick presentation with no interruptions and no lag times. Appreciate that. Um, and also, we have a partner in the West Side Pacific Villages, and they need your votes. Um, they are in the My LA 2050 Grant Challenge. They're one of just 25 finalists selected to compete at the chance to win a $100,000 grant to help make LA a better place. And they are the only nonprofit representing seniors. And um, the Health and Wellness Committee has been focusing on seniors. And um, so we would love to have you click a vote for them. Um, Carol Kitabayashi is the person that is representing uh, West Side Pacific Villages. I believe she's the executive director and she has put in the chat an easy way for you to do that vote. So if you have a second, that would be great. Um, but right now we would love for you to welcome uh, Dr. Donna Benton. She is a research associate professor of gerontology and director of the USC Family Caregiver Support Center at the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. Um, she was co-chair for the California Task Force on Family Caregiving, which led to a report which outlines recommendations for supporting family caregivers throughout the diverse communities of California. We are all in caregiving roles at one point in our lives, so this is um, was important work. She served on the stakeholder advisory. Oops, if someone could mute themselves, that would be great. Uh, she served on the stakeholder advisory committee for the California Master Plan on Aging, and that is what um, she is going to be talking about today. Um, and she's done research and diversity work groups for the plan that was submitted in September and in the fall of last year. Um, her research has been in the areas of evaluation of programs for informal caregivers, which uh, is probably the majority of our um, citizenship here. She's an advocate for the implementation of statewide policies on LTSS services and supports. And with that, um, Dr. Benton would love to um, have you in, say hello and uh, start your presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank, uh, thank you so much for this invitation. And thank you to Melin for, um, for really taking the time to help me craft what we're gonna talk about and, and being able to continue to disseminate information on what I think is one of the um, most important things that is taking place in California for all generations uh, uh, that are current and for the next 10 years. The, um, I, I call the, uh, I'd like to think of master plans and, and any type of plan and recommendations as really it's an art form that has to come together uh, with a lot of people um, and I always think of this Stephen Sodheim song that's the that that's called "Putting It Together." And so when I think of how plans come together, it really is a, a part of art. But it takes a lot of people coming together, and the appreciation for each type, uh, the art itself, is going to vary depending on how a person views it. So everyone can take a piece of, can look at a painting and, and like it for different reasons. And that's what a good plan um, will do, but it all comes together to make a nice piece. So um, that's why I call this the art of planning. Now, let me see. So the, um, these are the two, if you're, when you are looking for anything related to the uh, master plan for aging, there are two main logos that you'll see which is the California for All logo and the um, Together We Engage. So I think sometimes, you know, again, visually, 
if we know what to look for, I apologize. I'm not the best at grab screen grab, so it's a little fuzzy. It's not your eyes. Um, yes, ma'am. But if no um, one, was your foot good? Oh, okay. Um, it, it's not so if you look for things, sometimes you can see a logo and then that will link will let you know that, okay, this has something to do with the master plan for aging. So either of these logos, if you happen to see them um, when, when you're looking at things. Why is a master plan in California uh, important and why did why was it developed? Well, obviously, we know that in uh, the United States, but in particular in California, aging is really changing and it's going to change the face of California. The average age of Californians is going to be the highest life expectancy at 81.9 years. And we know that from the beginning since the 1950s, Californians are living longer. And so as people live longer, their needs and wants and desires have changed over time and we want to, as a whole state, we wanna thrive, which means that we have to be able to make sure that all residents, no matter what age, and as long as we live in the golden state, are able to um, survive and thrive in California. And we really, I really like to emphasize that the goal is for thriving. Um, by 2030, Californians 60 and older will be a whole 25% of the population. And that's a significant number compared to say, even from 2010. So as you can see, we've really had a huge growth in the over 60 population. And I always remember one person saying that right now, childcare is still um, seen as a, a key issue, but um, by 2060, the elder care will be something that will be very important. So all of the policies, um, and things that are maybe having to do with childcare will now need to shift to focus for an older adult population. We also know that um, another reason that it's important to have this master plan is because the population uh, of our older adult population is uh, people over 60, it's going to be very, very diverse, both by race and ethnicity, uh, diverse in terms of age, and diverse in terms of where people live and um, how people uh, and family structures. So we're seeing um, a lot of diversity and financially, there's going to be a lot of diversity within the older population. And I always, you know, many times we hear people and they say, okay, so there's young adults and then there's teenagers and there's little toddlers. But usually when it gets to older adults, people will say, well, it's just an older adult. But we know that the 60 plus population, the 60 year old is not the same as the 70 year old, the 80 year old, the 90 year old. And so all of those different cohorts uh, within the older adult population are just as diverse as somebody between the age of zero and 20. And so we need to be able to address that through um, having a shared vision and future for how we wanna um, be in California. So the master plan came about um, be through an executive order. And so this is something that was given by Governor Newsom currently, and it, it, it gave the order for there to be two types of groups that developed this master plan. There was a cabinet level work group that was to advise the secretary in developing the master plan and the advisors to that work group included the stakeholder advisory committee of which I was a member and within that, there was also a research subcommittee and a long-term care subcommittee. The report had one year to be done. We were hit somewhere in the middle of that with COVID um, uh, and the COVID crisis. But because this stakeholder advisory group and every all the other work groups were so committed, um, the, there was only about a two month delay in getting the report and the plan out um, from when the original date was supposed to be. The plan itself came together because there was a iterative process from the stake, SAG is Stakeholder Advisory Committee, LTSS is Long-Term Care Services and Support Committee, and then the General Work Group. From those groups, it, um, the recommendations as they were being formed would go both to the research committees so that they could think of what kind of outputs and how are we going to make sure that we measure the success of the plan and evaluate the plan and keep people accountable. And then the research committee would come back 
and their reviews and outputs and recommendations would go back to the stakeholder advisory committee. And there were several rounds of refinement for the plan before the final um, plan was given out, along with what kind of research outputs we would have to keep the keep accountability. This is just to give you a sense of the timeline from the, the executive order, which was in June of 2019, until the release date um, of this in December, which actually turned into January, because here we had the um, COVID-19, um, which is marked there at the bottom. But all along, there were just a, a ton of monthly and sometimes twice monthly meetings that took place between the Long-Term Care Services Committee, the stakeholder advisory process, there were subcommittees developed. Um, and one of the things is the first um, plan that came out was from the Long-Term Care uh, Services Committee. And that, that was the first plan. And so that was the first six month plan. And then the full plan came out in January. There was also, um, that was not part of the original um, or executive order, but was developed out of the stakeholder advisory process was the equity work group. And this really set a overall framework for all of the recommendations and discussions and um, pub, you know, how things were addressed is that equity became um, an important part, equity, um, diversity and inclusion became very important as part of the recommendations. And um, I think that, you know, this quote that says the route to achieving equity will not be accomplished through treating everyone equally. It'll be accomplished, achieved by treating everyone justly according to their circumstances. And what this really meant for us and, and what the equity work group um, came out is there's a framework that we um, had several, uh, we developed a framework of questions that as recommendations were done, we say, look through the framework and see if you, as you ask questions, you can make sure that there aren't unintended consequences that may lead to inequities uh, for the age group or within um, diversity or inclusion criteria. So what we wanted to ensure, and the reason I have a piece of cake here is that we the the uh, model that became became part of the work group was we want to have equity and inclusion baked into the process and not just sprinkled on top and so that's how uh, the approach came for the entire master plan so that uh, we made sure that it's embedded from the very beginning from decision making and that we certainly understood issues around systemic racism to be eliminated and that that is part of how you look through the lens to make um, of any of the uh, program recommendations. We also felt that it's important that when you make a recommendation um, in order to achieve some of that equity and inclusion is that you have to be very explicit about the communities and the issues that you're trying to address so that you don't use very generic language, but you actually name the communities and you name what type of diversity that you're trying to um, address in with your recommendations. And as I said, we wanna make sure that nothing has an unintended uh, exacerbation of inequities within communities. Um, I think I covered all of this. Uh, oh, except to remind everyone that with um, equity, you also have to look at the issue of intersectionality so that we know that race, class, gender, and sexual orientation intersect and can create a different set of circumstances so that the recommendations understand about the intersection for some people along race, class, gender, and sexual orientation, and that recommendations take into account that type of intersection. So overall, there's also the research agenda um, that that particular board looked together to have an advisory consortium. Um, they felt that there should be a university-based research alliance and some kind of data center that keeps track of all of the recommendations and what, um, how, how the evaluations are done. The overall for the um, advisory consortium, we had stakeholder meetings, we had evaluation plans and data collections, you had guidelines and and finally, um, 
the actual final plan came up with a, a data dashboard. I'm going to skip all of the data action center items so that I can get to the um, expected outcomes from the recommendations is that we wanted to make sure that we're able to evaluate the master plan on aging efforts. And that would be like, you know, what type of bills went through and then from those bills, what type of community programs and how do those programs create connections. We wanted to be able to look at the state data sources and fill in a lot of the data gaps. Many times we make there are recommendations within the uh, master plan that actually th there's no data there right now. So that means that we have to develop the database so that we can also then uh, look at the accountability and the progress of a particular plan. And we want to make sure that we engage new um, policymakers and academics who could work together so that we could really have um, evidence-based policy that's both age, disability, and dementia informed and sensitive. And so overall, the, the main goal is to improve the quality of life for all aging Californians. Altogether, um, and this is a very early, um, there were about 26 stakeholder meetings, a thousand public comments that were reviewed, 700 advisory committee policy recommendations were finally, um, after you know you kind of looked at the public comments and got them all into different buckets and 250 just stakeholder organizations sent in separate recommendations that were all reviewed and read through the stakeholder advisory committees. Um, the stakeholder advisory committee came out with, uh, this is the stakeholder advisory committee, and if you remember, in the, there's also the governor's advisory committee. So the stakeholder advisory committee, this is what they sent to the governor's cabinet level um, recommendations. And so they will not look exactly the same as what came out in the final report, but um, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap in the uh, recommendations between what the stakeholders recommended and what the final cabinet level and governor adopted for the master plan. The stakeholder advisory committee said that first of all, they felt that there was the long-term care services and supports should allow people to live and choose where they want to age and have help and help families um, it, within their communities at, as, the, um, as, as we need to do so. We also felt that living livable communities and purpose, we wanna be able to live in and be engaged in a community that's age-friendly, dementia-friendly and disability-friendly. So it became, it, we felt that that should be an overall goal for within the recommendations and how they all fell out. Health and well-being was an, another category, and that's allowing people to live in their communities and access, have access to services and care that optimize health and the quality of life. And finally, there should be some um, economic security and safety so that you can be safe from abuse, neglect, and exploitation, natural disasters, and emergencies throughout our lives. So part of the um, uh, overall goal besides the equity lens is that we wanted to make sure that all of the recommendations also had a, a viewpoint of a lifespan viewpoint with an emphasis on the uh, older, uh, older adults, but it should be also a lifespan viewpoint. So the final plan, which looks like this, is what came out in January of 2021. And it came as the master plan for aging and they um, called it having a five bold goals for 10 years of the master plan for aging. The five goal, bold goals that are to be achieved by the year 2030 is for the master plan. It's a plan for all people. So it has that lifespan approach and it's for uh, families and friends and coworkers and caregivers of older adults and the goals which one of the, um, you'll see one of the um, main differences is will be with goal four, but housing uh, for all, the healthcare reimagined, inclusion and equity and not social isolation, caregiving that works was pulled out uh, as a separate goal, um, which was not within the stakeholder advisory committee and being able to afford aging. So now what does that mean? Those are great goals. What does it mean to have these goals? Well, the five goal, 
Twofold Goals come with 23 separate strategies. And within those strategies, there are um, actual subgroups of actual recommendations. But um, to give you some of the examples, like for housing, the, the uh, strategies are having bills and, um, excuse me, legislation that has to do with more housing options, looking for transportation that goes beyond cars, having community spaces for all ages, and of course, emergency prep and response and climate friendly aging. So that's fell under all of the things for housing for everyone. Under goal two, under health reimagined, you wanted to have a nice bridge between what is traditionally healthcare system so that the healthcare system can be brought into the home and um, be able to have home care, home-based care as people need it. Um, and to, of course, the idea that we should have health care across our lifespan and be able to access and have affordable health care um, throughout the lifespan. An emphasis on healthy aging and whatever we can do to emphasize and um, have programs that help people with um, being able to access things that will help you age and, and with healthy aging. Having a geriatric care expansion, so that's the professionals and making sure that we have enough geriatric um, people trained in gerontology and geriatrics. A dementia focus um, for uh, under healthcare reimagined, making sure that uh, the dementia is understood. And dementia, of course, is that very broad term. That so it's ju not just Alzheimer's disease, but all the all any type of cognitive impairment. And reinventing the nursing homes. Goal three had to do more with inclusion, equity, and um, sorry, inclusion, equity, and not social isolation. So we want to make sure this is really where the equity goals, um, besides being baked in other place, but really um, being very targeted and where you're looking for equity and aging, closing any kind of digital divide. Um, and this, of course, became very apparent during the COVID, during our COVID um, crisis time and will continue. Um, there should always be opportunities to work throughout your lifespan, to volunteer and engage across generations, um, a, a protection from abuse and neglected exploitation, and to have some type of leadership in California that helps continue to drive these, the plan forward. We wanted caregiving that works. Um, under caregiving, you need to have caregiving both for who are family and friends. So the informal support network needs to be supported. There should be good paid caregiving jobs and creating of jobs and also have any type of care, uh, virtual care expansion so that caregivers and family members can have easier access to information online. Finally, under affording aging is we wanna end homelessness for older adults. You want some type of in, income in, uh, security and you want to have um, reduced poverty in this population. Um, as the goals, after you got to the five bold goals, they're actual, each of the goals is led by what they call a state partner. So that means this is the department that's going to be the ones putting forth policies and recommendations and legislation and programs. And so that's your state partner. There's a legislative leader behind each goal. And then there are stakeholder advisory groups that are also helping to move each of the goals forward. So this really helps with the infrastructure and keeping the programs baked in so that um, these goals don't get dropped. So as you can see, so for example, under housing, you have a state partner uh, with Ramirez, the leader is the legislator and under stakeholders, you have the programs like AARP and the Association of State Directors. Um, so the goal for here, and just and I'll tell you kind of what happened with this year's budget as I go through the goals, uh, under the new housing for all options, um, that means that they really, and by 2030, remember this isn't a one-year plan, it is a 10-year plan, you have millions of new housing options. This year's budget had um, a lot of things regarding housing, um, including the rental assistance programs, targeted housing for older adults, um, looking at um, overall housing in, in terms of licensing for um, assisted living and looking at different models for assisted living. So there were a lot of um, housing things that came up in the for this year's budget. 
that are directly related to the housing for all ages and stages. Under healthcare reimagined, it's again being led by the state partner under uh, JC Cooper. Um, Arambula is under the legislature, and like CEOs and the health plans are some of the um, state partners. They are target on looking at the equity cap and increasing life expectancy. Some of the the um, Cal Aim and a lot of the funds that are coming down from the federal um, level because of COVID. Um, there, there were a lot. There's a lot of legislation that is specifically targeting um, filling that gap for lower income families and um, older adults that are tar that uh, will allow for expansion. So that's putting back funds into the Medicaid program, getting dental um, dental is back into programs, um, being able to have more flexibility in terms of where you can get your health care investments in. Um, community clinics and the um, optimization of Medicare and Medi-Cal um, in trying to fill in any gaps and making sure that you also have more uh, collaboration between the two programs when it comes for payments. And under this, they're also uh, beginning uh, incubators around looking at long-term care insurance uh, for all Californians and how that would doing studies and recommendations that are coming forward to seeing how we can have long-term care services and support and insurance for all Californians. And that's also has been part of the legislation for this uh, year in California. There's inclusion, equity, and not social isolation. Several programs are looking for um, engagement for volunteering. There's the Cal, um, there's the California program has been putting out grants to that are specifically saying to have programs for older adults. Um, there is a significant um, financial investment in this year's budget for the APS programs and to to help with that. And also replication of programs that, that help address social isolation and um, the digital divide. Under caregiving goals that work, there's an investment in the caregiver resource centers, which are a statewide program for family caregivers. They're investing with federal dollars, um, raising the wages for um, in-home support service workers and other um, people in caregiving jobs. So as part of that, again, those investments all are tied back to this, the recommendations from the master plan. And that's where the, the funding and the budget and the legislature is putting money to tie it back to the master plan on aging. Within, when you go online and you look at the programs, you have the very big picture and then you look at uh, initiatives. So for example, um, paid family leave is one of the initiatives within the master plan. And we see that as a goal for family caregiving. Um, and so the investment in paid family leave, there are bills that are trying to make sure that um, for equity reasons that lower income people will have more wage replacement so that they may get up to 90% of wage replacement. That bill has not gone through and it still needs support in, from the community. So, the, um, but so that people don't have to choose between staying in their job and caring for a loved one. There are bills that have to do with family caregiving um, that are coming out of, of CHHS and um, investments in respite care programs. And that was also within the caregiver resource centers to increase funding to maintain um, respite dollars. Under affordable housing, uh, affordable aging, um, a lot of this stakeholder is coming through justice and aging and the state partner is through Department of Social Services. And they're really looking at closing that economic gap um, and so some of the bills that have come from that, again, have to do with CalAIM, long-term care insurance programs, um, a lot, a lot, the uh, tech type programs so that there's investment now to help with the infrastructure so that you can have um, better uh, inter internet access within communities that traditionally may not have that, both rural communities and within different minority communities. And then having even things like language access and making sure that um, translations of 
pro of uh, materials across all state government is more uh, is being actually done more rapidly than uh, tradition than before, and so those all became legislative bills. Just to give you a final comparison of the difference of, of wording, I would say, but not necessarily, I don't think anything was lost between the governors and the stakeholders um, recommendations. The key thing being that there were these five recommendations from the uh, governors, the five bold goals, and the stakeholders, um, economic security and safety priorities, um, were probably a different way of comp of, of emphasis on long-term care services and supports around fixing the system and having affordable housing. And we had the big bold goal of ending poverty um, in general. The key thing is it's nice to have all of these goals and to say that we're going to, you know, make California a, a place for aging better. But if you don't measure your progress and you don't hold people hold the legislative process and the programs accountable, we'll never know how we actually did progress. So part of the measuring of the goals is to have that uh, there is a data dashboard for the master plan. All the goals are on the dashboard and then within the dashboard, um, there are right now the dashboard some places there's data there because there is statewide data a lot of things like caregiving that works we don't have a large database to measure the impact of the um, legislation that comes out from caregiving so that means that we still have to add measures and of course as i said this is not a one-year plan it's a 10-year plan and so one the um data dashboard, which is going to be monitored and um, we'll be having like universities and making sure that there are grants um, given to universities and to pi public entities to do some of this measurement. All of that will be taking place. And that was in the legislation this year to help fund the beginning of the core for the data dashboard. There is some of that dashboard is up for every one of the five bold goals. And it does have a really easy to read indicator of progress within each of the goals. So um, in the final steps, you have 10 cabinet agencies that are partnering with local leaders, um, federal government and all the stakeholders. And there are over a hundred initiatives Within the first two years, I would say about 70% of those initiatives probably made it into this year's budget, which is really, really high for uh, California, and it's still moving forward. For us at the local level, um, we besides what's going on at the state is everything can feed into the master plan. So at the local level, they actually develop what they're calling the, the local level um, Plan, plan book for aging, and this is your playbook, so that you can look at who are your local leaders, what kind of data do you have for your city, um, for your organization, and then you can say what master plan initiative you want to, one or more, want to implement. You can build your action plan, how are you going to evaluate it, and then who do you, you know, stay connected so that you can give that information back. I know that for locally, it's very important for cities. Um, many cities may, may adopt saying that they're going to be, a, their local community is going to be a dementia friendly community, or you're going to, um, for within your residence, that you'll make sure that there is a uh, you know, review and have housing laws, or that you'll look at the homeless population within your area and focus on the older adults. Uh, in your area for homelessness. You may have food bank programs or you put together a, a helpline to help people uh, access resources. So your local playbook, however you choose to do it, is something that will then feed into the larger statewide efforts for the um, aging, aging together. So this is how we're all gonna build California together for the master plan on aging. And at this point, I'm gonna stop talking so that we can begin to engage and talk together. Thank you, Donna. Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, what questions do we have in the crowd? 
you want to raise your hands um i have a question how do we get uh get involved with the local playbook or who do we look to to start okay. working with them so that local playbook is it is on the um website so i'll make sure everybody gets the copy of my uh powerpoint but um usually under each initiative it'll say on your local playbook who's doing um like you may have your local AARP <coughs> or there may be a local, um, another city that has a specific program that's good for uh, doing like age-friendly communities or um, something to do around social isolation. And so there'll be examples of who you can begin to reach out to so that you might, so that you could replicate something that might already be going on elsewhere. Like the city of, um, West West um, Hollywood, I, I presented to them and they have a very, they've already have a four year or five year plan for aging that they've put together. And so, the, and so they're actually a good city to reach to, to see what a, what a small city uh, has done. So you can reach out to them and see how they put together their plan and they have the dementia friendly plan too. Do you know if the League of Women Voters in any cities you can or put questions in the chat? Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can raise your hand. It's how, I'm not the um, I'm not leading this, so I'll leave it to Terry to decide how she wants this to be run. <laughs> you can put it in the chat, or you can raise raise your hands. But um, Joan, did you have a question? Yeah, I did actually was whether the League of Women Voters in California or any of the local leagues have done anything in, in conjunction with this master plan. I know that they pre presented, I, I'm positive that I saw recommendations from the League of Women Voters in terms of recommendations that came into the stakeholder process. So whatever was written, I but I can't tell you if it was a local or the statewide but we i know that i certainly that they presented they something in writing so i am wondering if if there's a way that actually we could start something and then model it for the other cities yeah other local leagues so that's a thought for our members yeah what would be a good first step, Donna, besides looking at the, um, you know, the local playbook? Um, you know, it seems like, at least from what I know, there's lots of gaps that have to be filled and they seem very big. So um, <laughs> I, I look at it, it's kind of daunting. Okay. Well, first of all, you must have mission statements and goals already. And I always say, review what you have and see, think about how is that is it a lifespan approach? And then how does it impact the last part of the lifespan? What are the goals within your League of Women Voters um, that would help, would be age friendly mm -hmm. and older adult friendly? So maybe if you haven't had that concentration, then that might be where you wanna concentrate so that it meets your mission and goals. I apologize for not knowing your mission and oh, goals. No. <laughs> That's not your job, yeah, no. <laughs> But I always, if you start with that review from the lens of, okay, do, does anything that we're doing meet any of those five bold goals? And just think about that for your mission and then you can link it because you're not going to start something new. You want to make it consistent with what you're doing. Right. If you um, say, you know, maybe we want to have an equity lens and we haven't gone through and gone through and looked at our missions and statements and goals from a, a equity lens including aging and just rewriting your current goals and things to make sure that it has the equity, inclusion and aging lens is in a is a step in the right direction on meeting the goals mm -hmm. for an age friendly uh, program. Organization, I should say. Yeah. So. yeah. So um, you yeah. bet. Thank you, you have to unmute. unmute. Is there... unmute. We can't oh. hear you. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, okay. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Am I over? No, go ahead, Ross. Oh, okay. And then we'll um, get that. We have in Manhattan Beach, uh, the Jocelyn Center does an, a lot for uh, aging, for, you know, those who are aging. Perhaps uh, there's some way we could, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel, somehow coordinate with some of what they're doing um, and being sure that we're helping. My, what I've seen as the problem here, at all, if there is one, was uh, as an example, I was visiting the police station one day because I was bringing uh, some medications to throw in their pharmaceutical. They have like a special mm -hmm. safe you can throw your old drugs in. And as I was in this building, an elderly woman came in very, very confused. And she went up to the front desk where the police were, or the police person was, and was so um, unable to make it clear what she wanted. And the police person lost her temper with her. So I guess what I was thinking was, and this was over a year ago. So what I, what I did, because I work with elderly and all, was just to kind of went up to her and redirected her to go out of the building and to start to help her go home, figure out what to, who to call. But I was so disappointed that, you know, the police, now the police have so much on their hands and they are helping us tremendously in Manhattan Beach with homeless issues. Um, but I have a feeling that probably the Jocelyn Center, um, maybe, maybe having a con con you know, conference with them or a Zoom with them to see uh, if there's some way we could help out or they could uh, give us a, a, ch a chance to help uh, or give us some ideas. Great, so maybe helping them become a little more um, educated around dementia mm -hmm. for the, within that department, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the Jocelyn Center would be great for that. And Yvette's was yeah. next, I think. Uh, what, yeah. I, what I was thinking is uh, maybe we should contact the uh, State League uh, or the National League to see if anybody else is working on this same thing, because there is absolutely no reason to do our own wheel if there is another one available that we can modify. So I just th think that's an overall plan that we could attack pretty easily. Yeah, I agree. Carol? Yeah, I just actually wanted to make a comment um, that um, the health and um, wellness community that has been partnering with Westside Pacific Villages, um, that villages are actually uh, in one of the goals around volunteerism and engaging. Right, right. And so you guys are actually already um, uh, supporting the master plan um, through those efforts. So we appreciate the support. Thanks. Also, uh, here it Carol Kivashi, I was looking at a goal two, I wrote down lifelong healthy aging. And that's something mm -hmm. that uh, that this pro the West Side Pacific Village is, is doing mm -hmm. already to help yeah. people stay in their homes mm -hmm. and uh, get some services and not have to uh, leave the house until they <laughs> actually need a caregiver around the clock. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, very helpful. Yeah, so we're doing we're doing that, and we're also yep. looking into Hoth uh, two of our cities, Hawthorne and Inglewood. Uh, well, actually, that's what our whole goal, our health and wellness goal, was to see how we can help cities become more healthy, mm -hmm. and with uh, different types of programs. And we're looking at a Be Well program in Inglewood that. Uh, was helping uh, they had the program cover uh, how to help people get healthy by having taking some of their measure their weight measurements and uh, they had programs for exercise for eating healthy eating and it was to help help people who uh, may have diabetes and heart issues and obesity. And so that's where our program started working, wanting to do is have some healthy programs going on in the community. And then we, and then uh, 
COVID came and we changed and Westside Pacific Village was able to change their program. It was a fee program into a nonprofit in a not, not for fee program. And so uh, we don't know how that's gonna work out as COVID ends, but uh, those were, so those are some things we were doing in our committee. Sarah? Um, I appreciate Donna bringing us news about this, which relates to my concern. People need to know, one, there's something out there that, there's, that we're working on, but they also need to be able to access resources. I think there's a real problem of not knowing what's available. Correct. Where to go. And I think, you know, that would, it'll take some money, but I think that it's really, you know, this is kind of like emergency awareness. Like you need to let seniors know that there is, you know, support and uh, options out there for people. Mm -hmm. Great. Diane? question. I know it was mentioned that uh, training regarding Alzheimer's, dementia, that type of thing. Has there been any plans for training to the younger generation and from, from 59 on down? Because I think that a lot of people, if they're not involved, they don't have a grandmother who's experiencing some of these things, or they don't work in a senior center, they're not around seniors. They totally do not understand what dementia looks like. Uh, because I noticed that when we were open and we will be soon again. Um, a lot of times I would recognize dementia in one of my seniors. And when I call the family, they hadn't even paid attention. They don't, they don't recognize it. It's like they're in denial or they just think, you know, this is okay. She's okay. There's nothing wrong with my mother. There's nothing wrong with my dad. And so is there any thought to educating? And I don't know if high school would be too young, but just some way of getting the education out there, even on commercials. Um, I remember years ago, there was a commercial out that AAA put out and it had to do, and it is so impacted me. And I, I, this is at least 25 years ago about driving on the highways with big rigs and understanding how long it took them to stop, how you couldn't jump in front of them on the freeway. And like you're uh, jumping in front of a car and keep going. You couldn't jump in front and slow down. And they, they, the information was so great that I learned from that commercial that I saw repeatedly of how to drive and what not to do when I was with a, you know, driving next to a big rig on the freeway. Is there some thought of how we can educate people who don't recognize seniors that have, or it doesn't have to be a senior, but recognize dementia I'm in or uh, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, you might recognize a little bit quicker than, than dementia. My mother had dementia. She's gone now. But um, when she first got it, we didn't recognize it. I was still working for the phone company. So I wasn't working with seniors like I, I'm doing now. I've worked for 13 years in the senior center. I recognize it right away. What are the thoughts? Has there any, are there any plans? Are there any thoughts in place? I mean, I think part of the, um, if you go within the recommendation and the plans, they actually do recommend things like educational courses, you know, developing a curriculum for high school, for community, excuse me, community colleges um, as part of that dementia friendly. I'm reaching out to the local Alzheimer's Association to see what they're doing with younger age groups and maybe collaborating with them because they may be putting together some programs to reach that and they may need volunteers to go to, um, to the high schools or to the um, community colleges. So the plans do have that. Some part of it is making sure that um, you reach out to your legislature, your le legislative representatives to know that these programs, while you can have volunteers, some of them need money. And so that there should be funding uh, within the community colleges or programs or mandates for this type of education for, um, you know, like within the UC systems, maybe they can um, have different courses. So there's there are ways to uh, bring that education like you're recommending, which I think is an excellent suggestion. Uh, but we have to attack the issue from several ways um, and collaborate. 
I think collaboration is just going to be so important to get these things done. Malin? But yeah, I agree with you. Malin? I like, am I on mute now? <laughs> no, you're good. Okay, good. Um, it, it's really very interesting because as I listen, there are so many things already that's happening in our communities, you know? And um, when I look at the goals, the five goals, that is in the master plan. It does, I agree with, with Donna that um, there is a need for collaboration so that then we do not duplicate efforts, especially if money is needed. And if there's collaboration, then the different parties who are doing things already would be able to use a budget maybe in more uh, efficiently. And I was thinking about um, the CERT program <coughs> in Manhattan Beach, and I'm sure in many cities, we also have the CERT program. Donna, you were about to say something? No. I was listening. I was listening. Oh, oh okay. Um, and the reason I thought about this is because um, several years ago, we have a, a very active CERT um, program in Manhattan Beach, and they had had volunteers come to get the training. And in the training, um, they learn all about being maybe assisting in, in, in cer certain kinds of disaster. But they had a special program for the older adults. And it was a, a, a six weeks, one, one, uh, one, maybe I think it was about four or five hours a week for six weeks. And the, the emphasis was how the seniors could take care of themselves and, and how different their emergency bags might look like. And, and then um, they also then become part of the more or less have some kind of training. So um, I have not heard recently whether this uh, CERT program for older adults are, are still being offered. And, and so I, I think that's kind of a one way of following up. If that is something that um, the Health and Wellness Committee would like to follow up. And because I'm also the um, a chair for the Manhattan Beach Senior Resources Committee, which has been in existence for 16 years. And um, we could also follow them up because we did, we did also go in to the fire department and had a conversation with them. And, um, and when we can partner we can decide whether there is money involved or whether it, it is volunteers and, and uh, if the health and wellness committee wants to offer you know, community meetings like this with an educational component of either dementia, how do you handle a person with dementia if they are in a shelter? or if they're just beginning to show symptoms. And we had a member of our senior resource committee who had, who's now gone and she went into the police department and was um, working with the chief of police at that time where uh, um, the, um, the suggestion was if, uh, a family has somebody who has uh, memory loss that they could work with the police department with a program where this person's name and, and photograph and all that, this, this, this is also a privacy issue. And, and she was successful in some point, um, but people are always you know, worried about uh, privacy. 
And we did one time lose a resident and she walked out of Manhattan Beach and I don't remember whether she was found. And, um, and so I think that's kind of something that we can all maybe a little bit take an inventory of uh, what's going on in our community that we can fit into the, the goals. And um, the um, West Side Pacific Village had, had with, with, with the pandemic, developed a wonderful program for uh, taking care of isolation of the seniors. And the Jesselin Center also had very, very um, active program using the Zoom. Donna, what do you think the next steps will be for your committee? Well, officially our committee um, as far as direct reports for the governor it are over. However, we have been unofficially the entire group um, because everyone's been so dedicated and, and anyone can actually now probably join the committees. Um, we've been monitoring like this year's budget. So we did a lot of advocacy um, around pieces of legislation, uh, budget ask uh, that were directly tied to the master plan and wrote a lot of the support letters. Uh, clearly because of Zoom, we did um, advocacy and education meetings with um, officials uh, within the departments. Mm -hmm. But it's really been, and, and going out to communities and saying, you know, look at what legislation is out there. If you're with a group like your League of Women Voters that have advocates, um, find that piece of legislation that fits your goal and push for it. And particularly if it links to the master plan on aging. So there were um, a lot of goals like for under, care, under caregiving besides our own budget ask for the caregiver resource centers, we did do a lot of push for the paid family leave. Like right now, um, it's still uh, in legislation to have family of choice be the wording under paid family leave because we know that not everyone has um, a family member who by blood, but we certainly can choose our family so that if we're able to choose who can help us when we're sick and be able to have somebody on record as a family of choice to help us and be, then be able to take paid family leave when it's uh, available. So we're trying to get that legislation through there's something, there's a bill that needs support and it helps and it certainly helps it's a target you know, for more women and LGBT communities are impacted by needing that type of choice. And as we get older, it's going to be more women who will probably be helping sisters and um, mothers and other siblings, but they're not covered under currently, uh, covered under the word choice or women who band together as friends who wanna help care for each other. Um, when they need in times of need because yeah. we'll be living longer so uh, we won't always have you know won't be necessarily children adult children or spouses is there um a list of the different um bills that you all are supporting that you know we could help circulate or get behind um i can absolutely um probably the california um the california coalition keeps a list of the bills, um, almost every, and, and the, some of the bills are listed under the Department of Age, well not, Department of Aging doesn't list the bills, but they, they have the plan. And um, I'm just trying to think who's the best. Uh, most of it is, uh, I, I can send a link an email so that maybe you can get on one of the email distribution yeah. lists because the different organizations are taking the lead exactly. on different bills. Right, right. So there's, there isn't a single place because even for the stakeholder advisory committee, we've broken up into subcommittees of people working on different parts of the master plan. Right. So um, I, it, it just kind of depends on where, what your interest is so I think once you decide where you want to look, I could say you know like you could join the Work Family Coalition, the 
of California Aging Coalition, and some some have membership. Maybe most the larger ones have some kind of membership, but it's always based on your your organization's um, income. So they're usually very reasonable, and even within that, sometimes it's a trade. So if you can't pay the organizational fee, you are you know maybe you do more mailings or things like that. So yeah. So you would recommend, so we couldn't really join your committee, or like if we wanted to volunteer somewhere or access that information, we would have to um, align with one of the different groups that are kind of the stakeholders. Right, because the stakeholder advisory committee is no longer official. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And so like the dashboard or the master plan that like uh -huh. if we were, we could go to the dashboard and kind of, that's at the state level to right. get information about what you know the goals are. But I'll tell you who the main, the real push behind this is the Department of Aging, Kim McCoy Wade. So going on, and they have regular meeting like on Wednesdays. There's always a. Um, so I would go to the website for the Department of Aging under the. Um, master plan for aging and get on that mail list for sure because many of the legislative things announcements there actually are coming out of that the department of aging okay okay and they are linking people to what's going on locally from all the way from state to local levels so and having um even inviting okay. so the the dashboard is also there yes the dashboard is there also Everything is under okay. that master plan for aging. You'll see there's the dashboard, the playbooks. It's a very nice website. <laughs> okay, so we just have to dig our way through it. Roz? Well, I was gonna say another um, place to get some info would be AARP, mm -hmm. uh, the local AARP right. out of Long Beach or, you know, would right. really have what's happening for California. Right, they're, and they're keeping a very, you know, they're, they're definitely following all of the aging programs and, and anything that is impacting, and especially around long-term care. Um, they're doing caregiving. I mean, they're doing almost every piece of the master plan. There is an AARP representative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank so we, you. We Rafa. have worked with Rafi uh, in Southern California to try to work on the livable cities and oh, that's, thank that's you to our that's South that's Bay co uh, Coalition of Governments to city, you know, work with each of the cities to try to build a bigger plan through there, right. so I think. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the right. master plan, live, the livable cities, yeah, absolutely. Melinda? Uh, I, have, I have a question about the, um, the data center. And if, if we are involved in a certain activity, supporting the goals and uh, we are to collect data. Do we have a guideline as to what data is going to be um, important for the data center? Um, right now, there's so many gaps in the data center. If you go yeah. and look at where, because the data center will tell you where they're getting the statewide data but there are a lot of gaps there. There's new, they need some new data sets, mm -hmm. but if you go to the uh, dashboard, it, it actually does tell you where the data is coming from so that you can get a sense of um, what they're collecting. Uh, so, and again, that's all run through California Department of Aging. So CDA is your primary contact. Um, and I would start with a relationship um, with Kim McCoy Way, who's the director over there at uh, CDA. She's very, you know, now that everyone does Zoom, she's very open, her or some of her staff, maybe to coming. And when you have um, your, your platform, mm -hmm. they want to know what's going on and, they, and, and to see how they can be supportive. So um, informing people what you're doing is very important. You know, so you... Mm -hmm. You, you, we tend to keep local and forget to say, oh, and by the way, and let somebody at another level know, you know, just toot your horn. Go ahead and brag a little. I don't know, Melin, did I answer your question enough on the data dashboard? Yes, yes. And 
And uh, I am assuming that that is a, a very important component in terms of the um, efficacy of the master plan. Right. And, and over time, that will be about 10 years of data. And it will be mm -hmm. interesting data to follow over time what has been most effective, quite effective, and a little bit effective, and those that are, are maybe just kind of went poof. And it's also in, important to right. understand how, how come it went poof, <laughs> you know. And that's why you, if you don't go and look at what's on the data dashboard, you won't yes. know what you want to monitor. That's correct. Yeah. So looking at the, and it's a very um, interactive, I mean, they're improving it, but it's, it's based off of another dashboard that they were using for the Healthy Communities Initiative. So I found it pretty easy to, as a lay person even, to follow, you know, they ha it's nice little graphs and you can pretty much see what's missing right away. Um, you know, like sometimes there's nothing on different ethnicities. So you can just write, they have, you know, contact the days like, can you break things down by ethnicity or they may not have anything by age. You know, so, so some of the graphics had nothing, they didn't break down age except for 65 plus. And we know that you can't just make things for 65 plus. So we say, can you improve the dashboard and break it down by you know, 10 year bands or something. So we look at the dashboard. This isn't, as we said, it's 10 years. It's you idea. don't have to do this in the next week or month. You know, say, okay, in the next three months, somebody go look at this piece of the deck of this, this piece of this, and then start to chunk it out smaller till you figure out how it's gonna meet your goal. Because you'll probably end up with one dashboard that you wanna monitor or one dashboard that you tell them that they need to add. Yeah. What it, it's some way for you know voting? What's going on that would help impact the voting data that would be a, around aging? What should be on that dashboard? You're giving us a lot of things of to think about and where where to begin here. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have any other questions. Uh, I just want to say that um, this is a very exciting model, actually, and it um, it goes down to the community and then it goes up to um, our leaders and also elected officials. And um, it would be so interesting if this is going to be a a model that would really stick in terms of the future of California because it's it's already getting cha changing so much already. <clears throat> yeah. We, I think we owe the whole committee and Donna in particular a big thank you for all the time. It clearly shows that you spent hours and hours <laughs> and hours probably um, putting in recommendations together. So um, I'm, I'm the president of the local league and I think I speak for our league and I'm sure all the others so much for all that time and effort. And it looks like just a fabulous starting point for us to um, take and move forward on it. And I also yeah. want to thank Terry for moderating this program. Yeah, well, and I have, um, it looks like Diane has one more question. Diane just a, just yeah. a, a bit of information to all of you guys, because I, I'm just finding this out myself. There's an email that goes out and it's from uh, Briella Burke and it says in partnership with the DMV, then you'll see the real ID uh, emblem on the, on the email. They're sending it out to senior centers and those senior homes and whatever, um, wherever, I don't know if you get it. Don't use it. It's not, they're not associated with the DMV. When I got it, I sent it to my seniors. 
because it was more information again as a reminder that you don't have to go into the dmv you can renew your license if you're 70 or older online we'll do it for you when if you want to come in we'll take care of it for you if you don't do it and so we i sent it out and uh Today, I sent it to our ombudsman, who is Teresa, most, some of you might know her, Teresa Thompson. She's the ombudsman for seniors at the DMV. And she said, she said let me check on that. And I said, I'm, the reason I'm sending it to you is because they're, they're saying they'll help you with, but you already are our ombudsman and you already help us with this type of thing. And she said, let me check because I don't know who they are. And she sent me an email. I just got it back about 10 minutes ago. And it says that they are not associated with the DMV and you will find other charges associated. So if you renewed something and it costs $38 to renew your license, when you get to the end of it, they didn't show you what their fee is to do this for you. And you have no idea until you pay for it, don't realize you paid more than you should have. So mm -hmm. they are called the, um, what, whatever I told you, I forgot, the Real ID in partnership with the DMV. Please warn your family members, your, everybody you know. Thanks, Diane. I, mean, I think that's an important point. I mean, there's so many scam <laughs> things that happen um, and it's hard to keep track of it all, so. Well, they look so real. I mean, it just looks, Mm -hmm. you know yeah they even have the state emblem on here with the bear and the and the star and the you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's very official Donna, i have a question regarding the network uh, uh i don't go have you had i guess you haven't called a sort of a state conference and um, for people who are doing something in their community with regards to the goals and the master plan and all that so that we can share information. Like for example, what was that Yvette? Or um, mm -hmm. about the, uh, the scam and the ID. So this is also very important if, if there is a, a, a uh, either regional meetings or of the master plan um, periodically so that then we know we get some more communication with each other. The um, SCAN, S-C-A-N Foundation, usually has an annual meeting. It's like September or October. It used to always be in San Diego, I mean, Sacramento. And um, I don't know if they're, I'm assuming they'll have it again this year. And they have been really big sponsors of bringing together organizations locally who are working on the master plan. So they usually have a section in this, in the big scan conference. Um, if I, when I get the invitation or whatever, they start sending out information about that conference, I can forward that to you, Melin, okay. and to, to share. I also shared in the chat, the link to the uh, data dashboard. So hopefully you'll um, save the chat and, um, and then the master plan for aging is also, um, you know, a similar link to the data dashboard. Great. Good resources. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, we will wrap this up. Donna, thank you so much for your time and energy and effort and sharing everything with us and getting us started. And um, Malin and Harriet for helping get this all set up. So uh, again, just a reminder to vote for Westside Pacific Villages for the uh, LA Master Plan 2050. They would appreciate your vote. You can vote five times and until next Monday, I think, right, Carol? Yeah. So we you will- go to our website. Is, yeah, Sorry. okay. Great, it's on your website, okay. all right. And then uh, we'll have a copy of this presentation or our, the recording. Donna, would it be possible to get a copy of the presentation to also put it on our website? Or you sent it to one? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you everyone for being here. Harriet, anything else before we close up? Harriet? I don't think so. I just thank everyone for attending yeah. and uh, hope we'll see you again and participate in some of these great ideas that yeah. 
that Donna has presented. Just amazing uh, things to think about for our seniors. Get us going. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Terry, for moderating. And again, sure. Donna, great. And Malin, thank you for getting the ideas together to help Donna with her presentation. And I think it was just really wonderful to hear this very energized. Yeah. Thank you. More now. Thank you. Thank Thanks, thank you. everybody. The week. Yeah. And thank you so much for everybody being here. And these discussions are wonderful. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, I hope. Right. To, oops, I guess she's gone. Okay. No.